John Creasel may have lost his legs and two close buddies in Iraq, but he came home with a powerful message of hope and living testimony to the value of a positive attitude to overcome any challenge. John served as a NATO peacekeeper in Kosovo in 2004 before volunteering for deployment in Iraq. On December 2, 2006, his team struck an improvised explosive device, an IED, and he was not expected to survive. He died three times in the operating room, but 35 surgeries, and nine months later, he walked out of the Walter Reed Army Medical Center. He retired as Staff Sergeant following 10 years in the Army National Guard, receiving the Combat Infantry Badge, Purple Heart, Bronze Star, and other awards. In 2010, he was elected to the Minnesota House of Representatives, but decided not to seek re-election when his family said they wanted to spend more time with him. He is Director of Veteran Services for a county in suburban Minneapolis, Minnesota. He's a part-time personality on KFAN Radio. He's a motivational speaker and co-author of the book, Still Standing, the story of Staff Sergeant John Creasel, published in 2010 and winner of eight National Book Awards. We certainly are very thankful for his service. Please welcome Staff Sergeant John Creasel. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. How's everybody doing? Good. Well, I'm happy to be here. Just like he said, my name's John Creasel. I live in Cottage Grove, Minnesota with my uh, wife, Kayla. Just got married a week and a half ago, so things are good. I joined the Minnesota National Guard on my 17th birthday because that was my dream. That was my goal. That's what I wanted to do since I was a little boy. Uh, when I saw the first Gulf War on TV, I was around 10 years old. It was the first televised war in my lifetime. And I saw the men and women over there protecting our way of life and the way of life of people across the world. And I looked up to them. I said, if I could get paid to do that, then count me in. So I held on to that dream and I joined the minute I could. And like I said, that was my 17th birthday. That was the best decision I ever made because I was quite the knucklehead when I was growing up. I had to do a lot of my schoolwork in the hallway because the teachers didn't think I was as funny as I thought I was. So they'd send me out there, I wouldn't disrupt the class, everybody got their work done, everything was good. So I went to basic training the summer after my junior year in high school, came back from my senior year much better behaved. I wouldn't say I was a perfect angel at that point, but the drill sergeants have a very effective way of getting the smart aleckness out of you. All right, so I went through my senior year, graduated, and then that last summer, the awesome summer before everyone goes to college or starts their careers, I got to go back down to Fort Benning to complete my training, to hang out with those drill sergeants again. And I came back at the end of the summer of 2000 as a fully trained member of the Minnesota National Guard as an infantryman. Now at that time, the world situation was much different. Our primary mission in the National Guard was our one weekend a month of training, two weeks during the summer. And then if there's any natural disasters, floods or anything like that, we could be called up to respond to that. As we all know, once 9-11 happened, everything changed. Then it wasn't a matter of if we'd get deployed anymore, it was a matter of when. We got that call in the summer of 2003, although it wasn't the call we're expecting. I mean, with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan going on, we assumed that that's automatically where we would be going. But we were called to be part of a NATO peacekeeping force in Kosovo. I had heard about Kosovo, I knew that it was a dangerous area or they needed a military presence there at least, but I wasn't totally familiar with what was going on there. Now, the good thing in the reserve components, you always go through a train up before you're deployed so you know what the heck's going on and you're familiar with your surroundings. So we did five months of training at Fort Stewart, Georgia, one month in Germany, and then we touched down in uh, Kosovo on uh, February of 2004. Now, for me, at the age of 22, that was a huge eye-opener. That was the first time I had been in a third world country, and truly, that's the first time I understood and that it dawned on me how fortunate we are to live in the United States of America. I mean, a lot of the things that we complain about on a day-to-day -day basis, the things that we take for granted, 
are things that they would kill for. They would love to have our problems, you know, hashtag first world problems. Um, so we would go out on our patrols, and our mission was important. We would go out on, on patrols to make sure the sides got along, nobody killed each other, and then we would return to base. Never really were we in fear of our lives over there. Our biggest concern was beating the unit from Iowa in floor hockey and softball. So, I mean, we, we had internet, we had good living quarters, we had good dining facility, we had good workout facility, we even had a movie theater on camp. So as far as deployments go, we were given kind of an easy one. We would go out on our patrols and at the end of the day we would come back and talk to our buddies from the other platoons and you know, just kind of a how was your day kind of thing. And we would be in the dining facility eating a great meal and on the TV screens around the room there were large screens that would be rotating through the cable news networks from the United States to kind of keep us in the loop as to what was going on back home and in the world. And the top story every night was what was going on in Iraq and Afghanistan. Our brothers and sisters in harm's way coming home either wounded or killed and it made us feel guilty. We felt like that's where we should be. That's where we would make a real difference. And now, we don't hope for war. I mean, I would, I would think we're the last ones that would ever hope for war because we're the ones that have to fight in it. But if there is a war going on, we feel like that's where we should be because that's what we train to do. That's our Super Bowl. Now, not that I would know anything about a Super Bowl being a Vikings fan, but, um, <laughs> but we felt like that's where we would do the most good. And we talked about this every day, every time we saw something on the, on the TV, on the news, what was going on over there. We're like, gosh, you know, we could be helping those people. Didn't make us take our job in Kosovo any, any lighter or anything like that. So our six months in Kosovo went quickly and we came back near the end of 2004 after 12 months total with the train up and then our time in country. And my contract was expiring. So I decided I was gonna get out. I wanted to be a paramedic firefighter for the St. Paul Fire Department. So right as my contract was gonna end, one of my buddies that I was in Kosovo with, uh, he had moved to brigade headquarters. He goes, you're not really getting out, are you? I said, oh yeah, it's been real and it's been fun, but it hasn't been real fun. And he said, there's a deployment to Iraq coming up starting next year, and I know your thoughts on it. Kick it around, talk to your family, and get back to me. So I said, all right. So I gathered up my family. I said, fam, what do you think? They said, well, we can't tell you that you should go because if something happens to you, we'll feel responsible for it. And we can't tell you you shouldn't go because you'll resent us for it. They said, so let us ask you this. If you don't go on this deployment, when you turn 30 years old and look back on it, will you regret it? I said, absolutely. They said, there is your decision and we support that. And now that's the most important thing in life. It doesn't matter what we're doing, whether it's a military deployment, whether it's a demanding career, Having that support at home is so very important because without that support, we're not able to truly devote ourselves to that trade and it prevents us from being great. So I appreciated having that support at home and it was one less thing that I had to worry about. So I decided, yes, I would go. So I re-enlisted in the Minnesota National Guard and then those of us who had been on the Kosovo deployment, we hadn't been home long enough for them to force us to go. There's a certain period of time you have to sit back unless you volunteer and so we looked at each other and I knew I wasn't gonna sit at home and watch my friends get deployed and they weren't gonna sit at home and watch me get deployed. I mean, army friends are, are like family. These are the closest friends you could ever have. And we looked at each other and said, I will go if you go, and I will go if you go, and I will go if you go. So we went down there together and signed that waiver. And it was called a COTTAD waiver, but I still haven't looked up what it stands for. I know what it means now, but it said, I, the undersigned, vol volunteer to fight in support of the global war on terrorism for a period not to exceed 396 days. I kept a copy of that on my fridge because if something happened to me, I didn't want people to feel sorry for me, like I was a victim, like I'd been kidnapped. I wanted them to know that I volunteered to go because I believed in it, I still do, and I would go back in a heartbeat if I could. So I spent the summer of 2005 getting my ducks in a row, going through my EMT training uh, so I could be a part of St. Paul Fire eventually. I even tried out to get on the list. And then October 1st of 2005, we were sent to Camp Shelby, Mississippi to begin our train up down there. Camp Shelby is near a town called Hattiesburg, which many of you have probably heard of, thanks to good old Brett Favre. That's his hometown. I'm surprised they still haven't named it, just renamed it from Hattiesburg to Brett Favre, Mississippi, because everything down there is the gunslinger. And so uh, we get down there, and this is right after Hurricane Katrina had hit that had hit about a month before. So the camp was in rough shape. Um, I think the Army, 
I think it was already in rough shape, but the army liked to use that excuse that the hurricane's what made it in rough shape. And even at the end of our five months of training at Camp Shelby, the army even has satisfaction surveys. You can't get away from them anywhere. And it said, please rate your living conditions. And some of the quarters had uh, tarps on them. And it would say, on a scale of one to five, rate your living quarters. And then there would be an asterisk that said, please keep in mind that a category five hurricane rolled through here. Next question, how was your food? Please keep in mind that a category five, and I'm like, wait a minute, yeah. They want us to put fives on everything. Go on TripAdvisor and put that this is the greatest place you've ever been. I can't wait to go back. So after that five months at Camp Shelby, we did one month at Fort Polk, Louisiana, and then we flew to Kuwait for two weeks to heat up our Midwestern blood, get our weapons sighted in the last time, get our final issue of ammunition, and then we touched down at Camp Fallujah, Iraq on April 8, 2006. Now, Camp Fallujah, Iraq is a Marine Corps and Navy base. We're an Army National Guard unit. And now at this time, at the time I was deployed there, the National Guard hadn't been given the chance, really, to give us a good reputation. We were referred to as weekend warriors, part-timers, all of that, because we hadn't been put in harm's way. And so for this, we have that reputation at that time. And you all know about the rivalries, obviously. Army hates Navy. Navy hates Army. Marines hate everybody. <laughs> and so they were putting us at this camp, and it was like, okay, all right, let's see how this goes. And they had us in these large tents where uh, we could fit about 100 people in each one. And we noticed when the sun came up that we saw Kitty Corner from us, an incoming enemy mortar from a couple nights before we arrived, had destroyed that tent, like direct hit, and you could see sunlight beaming through our tent, all the holes in it. I was like, maybe the Marines do hate us. They're like, the bombs are over there. That's where we should put the army. So I'll never forget that first night, though, hearing the artillery fire. And it ended up being ours, but there's no training in the world that can really get you prepared for that. And so that's when I knew that training was over. This was the real deal. And if I wanted to get home to my family and get my men home to their family, I need to bring my A game. And so I slept that first night in my body armor. And not that that would have done any good. I think it would have been easier to identify me, perhaps. But uh, we all slept in our body armor that night. So the first month or so in Iraq was extremely boring. Now, at the age of 37, looking back on it, boredom in a combat zone is a very good thing. But we wanted to be out there. Team America, let's go and save this area and get home to our families. So they had us in these towers, looking outside of Camp Fallujah, making sure no one attacked. On 12-hour shifts, we would sit and just stare out at nothing. We would get done with our shift, we would go work out, eat chow, shower, and that was our cycle. So after like a month or so, and, and the nature of combat over there, they're not gonna gather up a big, large army like it's Middle Earth, Lord of the Rings, and just charge the gates. They don't do that, they know better. They launch mortars and rockets from a distance and they plant bombs in the road. Still, somebody had to be in these towers. I just didn't want it to be us. So after like a week or two, I'm like, why did we volunteer for this again? And uh, like anything in the military that seems like there's no rhyme or reason, there is always a method to the madness. You gotta crawl before you walk, walk before you run. And so uh, they had us do patrols just outside of Camp Fallujah, then into some vill villages a little further out, then a little bit further out, a little bit further out, until we controlled a massive battle space all the way down to the Euphrates River, an area so large that they had to add 50 Marines to our unit, and it was an area that hadn't seen American military since the initial invasion in Iraq. So this is where the enemy was able to do whatever they want, whenever they wanted. And it was our job to push them back further than a seven or eight mile radius so they couldn't launch mortars and rockets onto Camp Fallujah and put the 19,000 service members and contractors at risk. So there'd be days you're walking to go get dinner and you'd hear the incoming alarm, or sometimes not even hear the incoming alarm, and mortars would land down. There were people that died just walking to dinner. So it was our job to push the enemy back so they couldn't do that. Now, as we pushed them, they pushed us. And throughout the summer of 2006 into the fall, the danger increased exponentially. And so in the fall of 2006, at that point, we were one of only about three squads, and a squad's about 10 to 12 men, that had not yet encountered an improvised explosive device. And so uh, we would be out at one of the pump houses, we had two pump houses we're in charge of, that would draw water from the Euphrates River through irrigation canals so they could grow crops. 
And it's strangely, in the middle of the desert, there was farm fields everywhere, but palm trees. I mean, it was extremely beautiful. Um, these pump houses were targets because we would then supply water to Camp Fallujah, and they knew if they cut off our water supply in the desert, we're in deep trouble. So these would be under constant uh, target of the enemy, so we'd always have to have 10 to 20 men there. And so we would be, you could almost set your watch to it every night around 5 p.m. One of us would be on the roof watching for enemy activity, and you'd hear an explosion in the distance. And you would see a big mushroom cloud of, of dirt from one of the gravel roads, and your heart would stop. I mean, that 30 seconds of radio silence, waiting to hear your buddy's voices, see if they're okay, it seemed like 30 years. Then finally someone would get on, on the radio and say, everybody's fine, minor injuries. Then we could exhale and breathe. So like I said, at that point, we were one of about three squads that had been lucky enough to not hit an improvised explosive device. Like anything in life, if you operate on luck, eventually that luck's gonna run out. So when people ask me about my time in the military, sum it up as nearly 10 years of really good times and one really bad day. That really bad day was December 2nd of 2006. We were on a foot patrol in the morning from that pump house Flanders. We had to watch an intersection that was very critical to our mission. Insurgents had been burying bombs there often, and it was the only way we could get to the southern part of the sector. Now, strategically, it was important because that was the only way we could get to where the enemy was at. And they would obviously hope to kill as many of us as possible, if not kill, they wanted to maim as many people as possible. If not, at the very worst for them, if we noticed that the soil had been disturbed in the gravel road, we would stop back 100 yards, we would call the explosive ordnance disposal team and have them come out and use robotics to detonate it. That would take four to five hours for them to arrive because they were busy with all the other bombs in the area. But then, when they detonated that, our element of surprise was gone, the enemy knew we were coming, and so they still gained a strategic victory on that. So we needed to find out who was doing it and eliminate the threat. So we went out in the middle of the night, hiding in a ditch amongst cattails, which again, I found strange being in the desert, being in a ditch with cattails. So I was watching the intersection, we're out there watching, sun came up, nothing happened, shaping up to be a pretty simple day in Iraq. We got spotted by a goat farmer, so we had to break contact and go back to the pump house just in case that goat farmer was cooperating with the enemy they could call and, uh, and say how many of us there were, what weapons we had, and then we could be ambushed, potentially. So we went back to Pump House Flanders, we ate chow, took a nap, shaping up to be a pretty awesome day in Iraq. Now our lieutenant was up on the roof watching for enemy activity, and he spotted suspicious activity to the south. So he came and woke us up, said he needed five volunteers to be in the Humvee. So five of us raised our hands, said we'll check it out, and then there was three to be in a Bradley fighting vehicle to our front, and that's like a 32-ton armored personnel carrier, a small tank. And so there's a crew in there, there's two operating the main gun, and there's a driver in a separate hatch. And in the Humvee, there's four in the seats, one sticking out of the top, pulling security, operating the main gun, the turret on top. So we had it down there, I was sitting in the right front passenger seat, operating the radio. Calling in checkpoints on the map, letting our headquarters know our location, just in case we lost contact with them, they would know where to send help or where our general location is. So we get down there, it looked extremely suspicious. We searched everybody and everything in the area, ended up being nothing. So again, shaping up to be a simple day in Iraq. Now anytime you dismount your vehicle to search or do anything like that, there, you always leave your gunner in the vehicle to watch your back and to maintain radio communication with headquarters. So as I was walking back to the vehicle, our gunner, uh, Marine Lance Corporal Bruce Miller, informed us that one of the drones flying above had spotted someone digging in the road at checkpoint 34, which was two miles from us. We knew that they weren't planting flowers, so we had to check it out. So we get in the vehicles, and again, same configuration, that Bradley fighting vehicle to the front, we're the second vehicle, and I remember calling in checkpoint 31, checkpoint 32, and as we called in checkpoint 33, there was a 90 degree to turn to the south. And as we rounded that corner, I remember hearing this metallic clank, this plink, and then this loud whooshing sound. I don't remember flying through the air, and I don't remember hitting the ground, but I remember waking up on the ground. I hadn't yet opened my eyes, but I heard rocks falling, rocks hitting the ground, rocks hitting metal. It sounded like a hailstorm. I heard my friend yelling, what's going on? What happened? Where's Brian? Now, I didn't want to believe what had just happened, but like I said, I've been a Minnesota Vikings fan my whole life, so I'm used to the absolute worst case scenario, okay? So I opened my eyes, 
I see what had been a brand new fully up armored Humvee that we had been riding in. It was on its side, facing the wrong direction, completely destroyed. Parts of the vehicle were laying everywhere. Um, the doors, which each door takes four strong men to lift, those have been blown 100 yards in every direction. What had happened was our left front tire triggered uh, an improvised explosive device that weighed 200 pounds. It was 200 pounds of explosives packed into propane tanks that blew up directly underneath our vehicle. So I felt myself in a twisted, contorted, uncomfortable position, so I knew something was wrong. My left arm, both the ulna and the radius was broken, so that was kind of hanging there. So I was focused on that, I held that against me. I remember thinking, I don't want there to be any nerve damage. I looked down and see that my left leg, just above the knee, was connected probably by a piece of skin, but probably my pant leg was holding it together. The bones were sticking out. My right leg, just below the knee, looked like I stuck it in a wood chipper, and it was bleeding profusely. I was pretty sure that this is where my life was gonna end. So I tried to stay calm. The human body has an amazing way of doing that for us. I didn't really feel any pain at this point. I felt kind of warm and itchy. Um, we didn't bring a medic with us because with the high probability of us encountering the enemy, we wanted to have an extra rifleman with us. And that's just Murphy's Law. If you don't bring a medic with you, you get blown up. If you cancel your auto insurance, you get in an accident the minute you pull out of your driveway. That's just kind of how things work, I think. So um, the vehicle ahead of us, thankfully we all go through what's called combat lifesaver training. And I'm very thankful my friends paid attention in that class. So the vehicle ahead of us, that Bradley fighting vehicle was about 100 yards ahead of us. The blast was so powerful, they thought that they hit the bomb. So they stopped and the two men in the turret, they radioed down to the driver and said, did we just hit an IED? And he said, no, we didn't. So then they turn around and see our vehicle destroyed with people laying outside of it, and they knew the injuries were serious. So they immediately called a medevac helicopter, let them know how many casualties they were. They grab all their stuff, get in the air, and head towards us. And then as they get additional information, they'll relay it to the, to the helicopter. So they came rushing back to our location, and uh, the first guy that came out to me, so the two guys that were in the turret came out to provide first aid, and the driver got out of the driver's hatch to go in the turret and maintain radio communication with our headquarters and the medevac helicopter, but just as important was the fact that he was operating that turret to provide security and watch our back. We were sitting ducks, this was a perfect setup for an ambush, and I'm convinced to this day if it hadn't been for that Bradley fighting vehicle, we would all have been toast. So the first guy that comes up to me, my buddy Adam Gallant from Plummer, Minnesota, far northwest corner, um, one of his best qualities and worst qualities, he just can't sugarcoat anything. He doesn't have the ability to. And he comes up to me, he goes, hey, Crease, I'm not gonna lie to you, dude, your legs are really bad right now, okay? And I'm like, yeah, really? My eyes are fine, I can see that my legs are not. And he said, but we're gonna get you out of here, you're gonna be fine, okay? I was like, all right. So he put a tourniquet on this leg, tightened it, got the bleeding to stop, because this was the one that was bleeding the worst. He said, I need to check on the others, I will be right back. I said, okay, I'll be right here, I'm not going anywhere. So then uh, I hear him going to work on some others. There, were, there had been five of us in the vehicle, so they have to triage as well. Next guy that comes up to me, my buddy Todd Everson, originally from Greenbush, Minnesota, but now lives in the cities. He's the total opposite. He comes up to me and he goes, hey buddy, you look great. Everything's gonna be awesome, you're gonna be home soon, you're gonna see your family, you look amazing. It was the fakest smile I'd seen until I got into politics. And so, uh, he starts working on this left leg, tightening the tourniquet, it would slide off, he'd slide it back up, tighten it, it would slide off, he'd give the... Finally got the tourniquet to stay, kind of covered up my wounds with gauze so no, no more dust got in there. I said, I'll be right back, gotta check on the others. I said, okay, all right, sounds good. So at this time, this, based on the sounds I heard, I knew I wasn't the most severely injured, all right? But I had to make the decision to focus on my injuries and that if I were to survive, I didn't want my last memory to be one of my best friends, either severely injured or already dead. Not to mention, I need to remain calm, and that's not going to help me remain calm. So I kept closing my eyes, focusing on, on my situation, trying to breathe and just be calm. And uh, hearing the stuff that went on around me and all that, just trying to eliminate that. Well, then the guys would run by, and they're trying to keep me alert. They would, Psh, stay away, keep fighting. Okay, okay, okay. Stay away, keep fighting, okay, okay. The third one, like to this day I still feel, just bam, stay away, keep fighting. I'm like, okay, I just survived a 200 pound bomb blast and my friends are trying to beat me to death. 
Like, did they sneak their name out of my life insurance policy? I don't know. I don't know. So they're like, I said, stay awake. I'm like, all right, fine. So then as they're working on someone to my left, Adam comes over again, and like I said, the bearer of bad news always, he said, we're gonna have to move you. This is gonna suck really bad. And I thought, well, I couldn't get any worse. Wrong. So they flip my legs up onto my chest, and I've never been flexible, not a hockey goalie, not a gymnast, so that was the holy smokes moment. And when they lifted me up, that's the first time I felt pain, because my pelvis had been broken, so that was moving. They had to get me away from the vehicle, because they were trying to move it off of one of my friends that they were trying to rescue. So the vehicle was already unstable, and then with me next to it, they didn't want it to land on me. So they picked me up, they moved me away from the vehicle, off the road, to a safer spot. And then knowing that they didn't want to keep slapping me in the face, because that wasn't going to end well, they were going to knock me unconscious or something, they come up with a brilliant idea. Now the person you would have thought was most severely injured would have been the guy sticking out of the top of the vehicle from like here up. Marine Lance Corporal Bruce Miller, but all 140 pounds, soaking wet perhaps, got launched out of there like a Roman candle. And he's running around like a chicken with his head cut off, cut off just, what time is it? What time is it? His watch had been blown off. But he kept saying the same thing, so we knew he had a brain injury, although I'm pretty sure he started the deployment with one. He's a good kid from Idaho, and I, we always joke that if you go to Idaho and remove a potato from the ground, it has a greater IQ than old Miller, so. Um, so they came up with a brilliant idea. They said, keep Creasel talking. Brilliant, so they sit him down next to me. He's like, Sergeant Creasel, where do you live? Cottage Grove, Minnesota. What's your favorite team? Minnesota Vikings. What's your favorite color? Blue? Roger, Roger. Hey, Sergeant Creasel, where do you live? So like the third time through this game, I'm like, get him away from me. And he's like, negative Sergeant, where do you live? Now. As a good Minnesota boy, I knew I was in trouble because I felt myself starting to get cold. And I knew on an 80 degree December day in Iraq, I shouldn't be getting cold. So I, I said my prayers, I grabbed Adam as he ran by. And I said, tell my family I love him. And he said, like a good friend, he said, shut up, you're gonna tell him yourself. But it gave me hope, it gave me hope. That's the first time after that blast that I had hope. I was like, I need to survive, I gotta do this, I gotta hang in there. So I said my prayers, and I remember thinking, if this is the end, please hurry up, because it's not fun. And as dumb as it sounds, I remember thinking, go out looking tough. And so the reason behind that, I knew that at some point, my friends were gonna have to tell my family what had happened. And I didn't want them to, to say, you know, how John was freaking out, yelling, kicking, and screw, I wouldn't have been kicking. Um, I didn't want them to think I was suffering at my last moments. And so that was important to me, so I tried to remain calm. And uh, I heard in the distance a helicopter, and it was getting louder and louder and closer and closer, and I thought, that one please has to be ours, please. And I saw Adam run over and shoot a star cluster up into the sky to let them know that it was us that needed the help. Just in case the flipped over vehicle with dudes outside of it wasn't enough of an indicator. My luck, they would have been like, everything looks good down there, let's go get chow. So, uh, I see the helicopter coming in for a landing, and it was, you've seen the double-bladed Chinooks around here that the National Guard has. Uh, this was a smaller version of that, a Marine CH-46 Sea Knight, or it might be a Navy one technically, but that was coming in for a landing. With, um, with it was a Cobra attack helicopter in front, in case there was an ambush, they would have cleaned that up. And at the same time, our ground backup came, and their job was to secure the scene and, and gather up all the destroyed equipment and all of that. With them was a medic, was an ambulance, and a young medic. And he clearly hadn't seen anything like this because he comes running over. He's like, hey, Sergeant Creasel, oh. Yeah, the first thing they teach you is reassure the casualty. He didn't know what to do. I mean, like Todd could teach a class on that. He's like, man, that shrapnel fixed her face. Except that big nose of yours, That's, there's no help for that. But uh, so the medic goes, I'm gonna give you morphine, okay? And I'm like, whatever, dude. So he stuck morphine in my leg. They put me on a backboard, put me on the helicopter. And that helicopter took off faster than any bird I had uh, ever been on. And I remember them saying, John, John, what's your social security number? And I thought, great, I'm not gonna survive. They wanna quick open up a credit card in my name. And uh, they were checking my level of consciousness. They give you medication, then that's how they check. And I was so exhausted, I couldn't even get the first number of it out. 
And that's the last thing I remember till I woke up eight days later at Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, D.C. During that eight days, I had been to two field hospitals in Iraq. First one, they removed what was left of my legs. They shocked me back to life three times. Second one, they stabilized me for my transport to Germany. And then Germany is where they had to work to get me stabilized enough to get to the United States. So I woke up at Walter Reed Army Medical Center to an unfamiliar woman's voice. She was saying, John, John, do you know where you're at? I opened my eyes. I saw it was a hospital room, so I thought, this better not be heaven, otherwise somebody lied to me. Might be the other place that my school teachers were right. Uh, I said, Germany? She said, no, you were just in Germany. You're now at Walter Reed. Welcome home. So I said, okay, thank you. Then she said, do you know who this is? Standing next to her was my ex-wife. I said, yeah, I've seen her before. She goes, well, what's her name? And I thought, well, that's a stupid question. Then I couldn't remember her name. And the look on her face, like, he's even worse than the night we first met. And uh, thankfully, I didn't just start guessing. Brittany, Susan, Rachel, Kim? Would have, uh, would have caused some issues. Would have had to sleep on the couch. But the good thing about not having legs, I can sleep on the love seat and there's tons of room. <laughs> uh, so I remembered her name and everything was good. So I, I, when you're in a medically induced coma, you have crazy dreams. You don't know what's reality, what isn't. So I looked around, I saw what happened. I saw that my legs had been amputated, left one above the knee, right one below the knee. My arms were in casts, my, I had a seat collar on. I had a wound vacuum on my stomach because when the bomb went off, it opened up my vest, so I took shrapnel there. And I'm kind of glad I didn't see that when I was in Iraq, it would have been troubling. But in politics, it would have been a great comeback for when they called me gutless. I could say, no, I've seen them, they're there. Um, so all of this quickly became reality and everything came rushing back. The sights, the sounds, the smells. It's tough living through it once, but having to relive it so soon after is a nightmare. And I asked, I said, where's Tim? Where's Nellie, my best friend, my squad leader, my roommate? He was in the seat behind me when we hit that bomb. And I was told he, he survived, he got nicked up, but he was still in Iraq and he was gonna return to duty in two weeks. So I said, Phew. Then I said, what about the others? And she had that look on her face, she really didn't have to say a word, but she told me two of my best friends, Corey Ristead from Red Lake Falls, Minnesota, and Brian McDonough from Maplewood, Minnesota, had both died in the blast. For me, that is absolute rock bottom. That is the lowest I've ever felt in my entire life. Like I said before, military buddies are the closest friends you could ever have. They have proven their loyalty and devotion in the most dangerous and difficult of circumstances. So you never have to question their loyalty. They've been there for every embarrassing moment of your life, it seems like. They won't tell anyone else about it, but they'll remind you about it every day. These are family. You have all these plans. When we get back, we're gonna go to Vegas. We're gonna raise families together. We're gonna do this. In the blink of an eye, it's all gone. My second favorite thing about the military is it's the best preparation for life you could ever ask for. I mean, we train and train and train until everything becomes memory. And in the rare situations where there's no training for it, there's a manual that will explain what to do in situations. There's a manual on how to take care of that pitcher of water, which is why I love the Army, because for idiots like me, it works out perfect. There's always an answer. This was the only time in my Army career that there was no answer for how to deal with the loss of two friends turned to this page. There was none of that. So it was rock bottom for me. But it was also the moment that I started living my life because I realized it would be pretty crappy of me to sit and feel sorry for myself when I got a second chance at life that my friends didn't get. And I feel like that's when I truly started living my life. All right. I decided at that moment I was going to try to make the best out of every day moving forward. And so I don't want the message up here to be sadness, okay, please. I don't want anyone to feel sorry for me. As crazy as it sounds, I'm happier now than I've ever been in my entire life. It's because I appreciate every day on this planet. I mean, when I get up in the morning and put my pants on my legs and to put my legs on, that's a reminder of what happened. But it's something I never want to forget because it keeps me humble. All right, so I'm, I'm not saying to feel sorry for me. Please don't. And I'm also not saying that what happened to me is gonna to happen to anybody in this room, because it's not. But a certainty is we're all gonna face some sort of adversity in our lives, or already have. It doesn't matter how big or how small that adversity we face is, it's the attitude that we bring to the table that will help us overcome that adversity and overcome anything in life. And when we get through it, we'll be stronger, better people because of it, and we will have learned from it. 
That's the most important message I want you to take away from here today, okay? Um, life is good. Life is good, and I feel like we forget that so often. You know, it's about perspective. I know I could spend every minute of every day for the rest of my life wishing that day never happened, wishing we never hit that bomb, wishing my two friends were still alive. But I know that would be a tremendous waste. No matter how much energy I put on that, it's not gonna change what happened. What I do have control over is my attitude today and my attitude moving forward. And it's up to me to make today great, all right? Life is so good and we forget that. You know, before all this happened, I feel like the worst day of my life was January 17, 1999. Gary Anderson missed a field goal that would have put the Vikings in the Super Bowl. I was there. I was chanting, Super Bowl, Super Bowl, and we all know what happened. At 17, I didn't think the sun was gonna come up the next day, but it did. And when I woke up at Walter Reed Army Medical Center and realized two of my best friends had died and I was gonna be in the hospital for who knows how long, I didn't think the sun was gonna come up again either. But it did, it did, and I'm stronger for it, my family's stronger for it. So uh, obviously we all go through tough times. There's simple days where we're just in a funk, you know? And I know uh, I was given some advice a while back that I thought was tremendously corny, but I've used it and it's awesome. So on those days where you're just like, why am I in a funk? And you talk to your body as you try to cheer up and you're just like, it's one of those days. It might be the weather, it might be something. But take a post-it note and write three to five things in your life that you're thankful for that bring you joy. And you put that to your bathroom mirror and when you wake up the next day, that will be the first thing you see. And a, a positive thought in the morning changes the trajectory of your entire day. All right? Life is so good. And I know it's, it's tough, especially in the climate that we're in now. So much negativity out there. The newspaper, the news. So I live in the Twin Cities, and my, the, the news channel that I watch most often is CARE 11. It's an NBC affiliate. And I'll watch the news in my exciting life at 37, I try to stay awake to the end of the newscast, the 10 o'clock news. And you look at like the first 10 minutes, it's like tragedy, sadness, accidents, like awful stuff, right? And since we live in the upper Midwest, you throw in weather and sports, and it's like 25 minutes of sadness, especially in Minnesota, right? But at 1034, there's a segment called Before We Go. And I don't know, I don't think it's called that anymore. I don't think it has a title, but it serves the same purpose. It's always a random, positive, uplifting story to put a smile on your face before you go to bed. And it works for me every time. And now that's an analogy we can use in our everyday lives. Um, you know, there's things that we can't control and instead of getting mad about it, try to make the best out of it. Now in the Twin Cities, I, one of the things that fires me up the most is traffic. And I gotta remind myself always, I can't make the cars in front of me go faster. So I just flip on my favorite radio station and try, you know, something to cheer me up. Just focus on the things we can control. Life is so good. So that, the message here today, again, like I said, is that control the things you can control. And while we can't control the things that happen to us, we can always can, can control how we respond to those. My goal, one of my goals uh, was to not ever be like, oh, John Creasel, oh, that's the guy that lost his legs. And when I was elected to the Minnesota House, I was kind of like at first, was like, oh, that's that state rep that got hurt in Iraq, which is fine, no one means anything by it. But I, I wanted to not be defined by what happened to me, but by how I overcame it or achievements that I had. And so now it's nice sometimes people walk up and say, thanks for helping get the Viking Stadium built, which is good, instead of thanks for losing your legs. <laughs> um, so yeah, in closing, I just want to say, I know that there's other veterans in this room. And I don't think there's a day that goes by without someone saying, thanks for your service. And that means a lot to me, and I know it means a lot to other veterans as well. But as people like you all in this room and your families and the work you do in your communities that make this such an awesome region to live in. And I know when I got hurt at Walter Reed, I got get well cards and thank you letters and people had fundraisers uh, raising money to help me build a handicap accessible home. People I had never met just out of the kindness of their heart and it's people like them and people like you all that make this the greatest region I've ever lived in the greatest country the world's ever seen. And that's why no matter what, no matter what you see on TV, no matter how dangerous the world situation is, 
There will always be people that volunteer to defend it because it is worth it. It is worth it because everything you all do and your families and the people in your communities. So thank you for making this the greatest country in the world, greatest region in the greatest country in the world, and for making it the greatest place I've ever been. So thank you so much for everything you do. I think, are we gonna do questions? Otherwise, if I talk too long, I can go. But first, I just wanna thank you for having me here today and sharing my story. I will be outside uh, selling my book and uh, chatting with you all, so hang out. Are we doing questions or no? Let's do a couple questions. Let's do a couple questions. Thank you. Just add real quick, you know, listening to you, um, it's hard not to get emotional about that, but uh, we get complacent. We really do. We get so complacent uh, in our daily lives, and you really put things in perspective. So, on my behalf, thank you for that. Thank you. I really appreciate that, sir. Um, do we have a couple of questions uh, for John? Not offended by anything, so let it rip. <laughs> we have a roaming microphone. He's got it right there. All right. If we are uh, waiting for somebody, um, just uh, as you mentioned too, sure. that the book sales are available in the exhibitor exhibitor area. So I think we have a oh. question over here. Whew. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> just, just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your talk, uh, Radio Career, that was mentioned. Sure, yes. So I am on weekly on the Power Trip Morning Show, KFAN, Minneapolis. Um, yes, love it. Available on the iHeartRadio app. If you're not from the area, then it's fine. Um, yeah, so when I was back on leave from Walter Reed, it was like five months after I'd been hurt. I was coming back home for the first time to, to appear at one of the fundraisers that uh, some friends were having and the National Guard media guy had brought me around to different TV stations and radio stations and to talk about what happened to me and about the fundraiser and stuff. And I went into that Power Trip morning show and we just hit it off. It was like just chatting with friends. That was May of 2007 and I've been on ever since. They said, when you get back from the hospital, whether that's a year, two years from now, come in for a week and just be on the show and it will be fun. So I did that. And they were like, feedback was really good. You want to come in weekly? And so, yeah, ever since, it's just been awesome. I, some, I still can't believe how it worked out, but it, sometimes things just do, yeah. I do have some good news for you, I think, with the severe weather potential in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area at their meeting in the Viking Stadium because nothing touches down there. You've heard the joke. I have, well, yes, <laughs> yes. That one, I, we can't use the, the green, my favorite Green Bay one back in the day was that they had to rip up the field at Lambeau because there's too much moss in the end zone. That one's many years old now though. Now we're the butt of every joke, that's nice. But the, the good thing about being a Vikings fan though is I feel like it did prepare me for this. When I looked at my legs and saw them angled, I was like, here we go again. But I'd still be the best kicker on the Vikings. <laughs> that's right. Uh, one more question. All right, that's, oh, there is one. Oh, okay, great. How has your care been um, through the Veterans Services, and do you think that the care in general is improving under the current administration? Yes, I feel like it is improving. There's always ways for it to improve. I use the VA for everything. I think where it gets a bad rap is for emergency care, which they're not designed for. So if people don't have private health insurance, they go to emergency room, they say, bill the VA. The VA, the law says that VA may pay for that, which we all know when law says may, it doesn't mean that they will. Um, so for me, I use the VA for everything, for my, my awesome prosthetics that are like state of the art. They will call when a new prosthetic is available and say, you wanna try this out. So they are amazing. They have been nothing short of awesome to me. Of course it could improve, but I was terrified to leave Walter Reed because that was the best care facility in the world. But they said the VA will be good, especially Minneapolis. And I know Fargo's got a good VA, so I've had no issues whatsoever. They even got me a tracked wheelchair so I could go hunting with it so that I could still hunt. So like they, they go above and beyond. 
37, so. Um, um, one well, more thing, okay. I just wanted to say, I should have started with this, but thank you for your service. And thank, thank you. For your positive attitude and for encouraging others to cons consider the military even after your really life-changing experience. It's thank you. super inspiring, thank you. I appreciate it. Best job I ever had. Absolutely, sir, thank you for your service, uh, John Creasel. Again, one more time. Thank you, guys. Thank you. You got it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's meet back here at uh, about 2.45. Short break. <laughs>